Hello, Steve Mills here. Uh, great to be back on my podcast the second time today. You're in for a great treat. I uh, interviewed Alan Cook uh, this morning and we spoke about a uh, little bit about table tennis and how we'd got on and how long we'd known each other. But we were also talking about um, how being uh, effective and uh, you know, world class at uh, table tennis or at sport is also very similar to being world class in business. And uh, uh, thanks, Alan, for a great interview. Uh, today, I'm going a little bit back into my past. And uh, a little while ago, I recorded um, a, um, a a program, uh, some advice uh, on audio that I thought I'd share with you. Um, it's uh, based on a program called Raving Fans, which is actually based around a fantastic book that I read many, many years ago uh, called, uh, believe it or not, Raving Fans. And it's all about the difference between satisfied customers and those who are true raving fans. In other words, people who buy from you, they have a great relationship with you, they like you, you like them, they recommend you, uh, they, if you recommend a product, they'll probably buy it, they don't, you know, really argue over price, because uh, they believe um, that you offer great value, and so on and so forth. And yet, so many businesses uh, say to me that we, we aim to achieve customer satisfaction, and Ken says that satisfied customers are people who, you know, they, they sort of buy from you. They you know, probably buy from you again, uh, but they're not real true raving fans. And uh, this is a recording, actually, of a talk that I gave, uh, as I said, many years ago. Uh, but it's still as relevant today as it was then. So without further ado, sit back, relax and enjoy uh, this uh, recording. And I look forward to speaking to you again at the end of the recording. Thanks very much for listening. Here it comes. Just hang on a second. You're going to get a nice musical intro. Here it goes. Off you go. Welcome to Raving Fans. My name is Steve Mills. I am going to take you through a 40 minute program to transform your business, to help you to push your business where you want it, to get the results, to get the outcomes, to get the income that you deserve. If you think about it, there's a very old but true statement, and that is, if you always do what you've always done, then you'll always get what you've always got. And most businesses, in my experience, talk about creating satisfied customers. They actually tell you that part of their mission is to create satisfaction. We want people who are reasonably happy with what we provide. And I'm here to tell you, you don't want that. You do not want satisfied customers. What you want is raving fans. You want people out there talking about your business, telling other people how wonderful you are. Because as we all know, the best way of winning business is through word of mouth. I've worked in hundreds of businesses over 25 years. And as a marketing consultant, people tell me that well, we spend money on this, on that, on advertising, on direct mail, on our website, and a whole variety of different disciplines. And when I ask them, well, where do you get most of your business from? They normally tell me, well, it's word of mouth. And I'll say, right, okay, so let me see if you've got this right. You're spending 20 grand a year on advertising, and you're getting all your customers from word of mouth. Is that true? They look at me a little bit quizzical and sort of very nervously say, well, yes. And then I'll ask them, so what are you doing proactively to increase the amount of business that you're getting from word of mouth? And they'll say, well, nothing. It just sort of happens. So my question to you is, 
are you willing to run your business in a way that customers come into it on a just as it happens basis? Or do you want to proactively look to drive businesses and drive people into your business? What I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is raising your standards. It's pushing yourself, pushing your business beyond your comfort zone. Something I called, can I? Constant and never-ending improvement. Because if you have a standard, generally, which is pretty poor, what sort of a result do we get for poor? Well, when I ask business owners throughout the world this question, I'm normally told, well, it's poor. You get poor, poor in a business, I get poor result. I'm not sure whether that's actually true. I actually believe if you're poor in your business, you get pain. How long are you going to stick around in that business? Just examine the facts. 80% of all people who are going to business today will go out of business within five years. Now, if you're poor in a relationship, examine the divorce statistics. If you're poor in your health, there are massive implications. If you're poor in your job, you're probably going to not have that job for too long. So let's take another step up to something that we call good. When you're good in your business, what sort of result do we get for being good? Well, people normally say, well, it's a sort of good result, but most people don't have a good business that's giving them everything they want. Most people do okay. They don't have enough pain to either pack their business in or, you know, go and get a job, but they don't do that well. They do okay. So good equals okay. So let's take another step up the list there to something we call excellent. When we're excellent, we're better than most people. We're a good step above good. When we're excellent at something, what sort of result do we get for being excellent? Well, it's quite a painful result because we get a sort of good result. We're way above most people. We're one of the best in our field, but we don't get an excellent result. We get a good result, and it's totally unfair. But just take, for example, the, uh, you know, the England World Cup rugby team. What did they get for winning the World Cup? Well, they, got, uh, they certainly got the cup, they got medals, they, uh, they became heroes overnight. In fact, heroes for the rest of their lives. Most of them became millionaires overnight. They got OBEs, MBEs, they got knighted. Let me ask you a question. What team finished third? And when I ask people that, they normally say, uh, I can't remember. What? They're the third best team in the world, and you can't even remember who they are. That's what getting to the next level is. And the next level above that is only a little bit better. And it's something called outstanding. Because when you are outstanding, and if you turn the word round, it's standing out. When you stand out in your business, that's where all the rewards are. When you stand out in your management, when you stand out in the way you look after your staff, when you stand out in the way you look after customers, when you stand out in your sales and your marketing and the way you manage your finances within your business, that's where all the rewards are. So you and I have got to become outstanding in our business. I'll give you another example. You go into a sales presentation and typically people will get two or three quotes all from qualified companies, all from people that are at least good and possibly excellent. You do your presentation, and so do the other two, and what happens? The customer will pick the one who is outstanding, the one who stands out from the other two, the one that's just maybe got the edge, the one that just maybe was a little bit more friendly, or a better pre presenter, or had better information, the one who's got the edge. Another question for you. What does the person who came second get? You know the answer. They get absolutely nothing. It's the same in a job interview, isn't it? You know, ten people this time, maybe in a job interview, the person who wins gets a job, 50 grand a year, thank you very much. The person who finishes second gets absolutely nothing. So we, in our business, have got to find ways of being outstanding, of standing out. And that is the theme of raving fans. I'd like to start by taking you through what I call the key drivers of sales within a business, because part of providing a service 
where you're going to get people to talk about you and recommend you and use you again and again and again, comes back to the marketing side of the business and the way you sell and the way you provide outstanding customer service. So let's look at the three ways of growing any business. And the first one are the number of customers. The second one is how often they buy from you. And the third one is how much they actually spend each time they visit you. So if we start off by going back to the first one, the lead generation, the number of customers. Do you know, for example, how many leads were generated within your business last month or last year? Because if you don't, there are implications there. Because how do you know what's working and what's not? Because you're probably undertaking an amount of marketing within your business. And that marketing will probably have a fixed cost. And that cost bears no correlation to the number of inquiries. For example, the advert that you put in the local magazine or, or business news or whatever it is will have a fixed cost. Let's say a £1,000 for an advert. It doesn't matter whether that advert produces one lead or a thousand leads. The costs are absolutely the same. So what you've got to do is first of all measure how many leads come in and then look at ways in which you can improve your lead generation. And you can do that by testing, by trying different marketing approaches in order to get more value out of your marketing budget. Secondly, once you've got those leads, we need to think about, well, what are we going to do with them? How many of those are we going to close? How many of those are you closing at the moment? Are you closing 90% of your leads or 10% of your leads? If it's only 10%, you might need some training. If it's 100% of them, you might not be charging enough. We'll talk about that in a few moments. So what is your lead conversion rate? If you're a business that would then have a meeting with someone, we need to then consider what is your meeting to order ratio. Maybe that we're getting lots of leads, but we're not actually managing to sell those leads once we get to the meeting. Or maybe you're not getting to the meetings, you're not doing well enough on the phone. So all those key sales drivers, we need to make sure that we maximize all those areas. Lastly, under the number of customers, is your customer defection rate. In other words, your loss of customers. How many customers do you lose over a given period? We need to consider that. We need to work out what it is and then look at ways of reducing your loss of customers. So on to the second way of driving business, and that is how often they buy. How often do people buy? So what can we do to improve how often they buy? How, how long do they stay with you? It's certainly an area to, to be considered. What I call the lifetime value. You know, if a customer wants to buy from you, they buy from you again and again and again, every day, every week, every month, or every year. What's actually a customer worth? Because if a customer, an average unit of sale is, say, £100, and that customer buys from you um, once a month, it's very easy to work out that they spend £1,200 a year. And if on average a customer stays with you for 10 years, we know then that the lifetime value of the customer is £12,000. You can then very easily work out how much you can afford to spend on your marketing budget to win that customer in the first place. The third area is how much they spend. And there are two real key drivers here under that heading. Number one is the price you charge. What is your pricing strategy? Are you at the bottom of the market? Are you in the middle or are you at the top? Where do you want to be? Do you need to increase prices? What would happen if you did? You need to consider, is your marketing strategy and is your sales pricing strategy as effective as it could be? Test putting your prices up. See what happens. A lot of people in business are scared to offer the right price. They undervalue themselves and they don't charge enough and they don't make enough profit. So test pricing. Test pricing within your business. The second area is the quantity that they buy. Are there ways in which you could sell them more of the same product? Are there ways in which you could sell them different products? 
Are there ways in which you could get them to come back more often and buy more? Are there ways in which you could bundle products together in order to create a larger unit of sale? One of the best organisations in the world at this are an organisation I'm sure you've heard of called McDonald's. I'm not advocating that McDonald's are a wonderful product or a wonderful business. One thing they do really well is to what I call upsellers. Because you and I walk in there and we say, can I have one Big Mac please? They say, yes, certainly. Is that a Big Mac meal? And we go, ah, uh, yeah, okay then, yeah. And they'll say, yeah, sure, would you like to go large? And you go, ah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay then, yeah. What have they just done? They've just sold you twice as much as you intended to come in with. And that's from a 16-year-old guy who hasn't got any sales training, any business training. He's just there working for the summer in a job. So if they can do it, I'm sure we can. So let's look at how to create satisfied customers then. Well, we already mentioned that we don't want satisfied customers, but if you think about what satisfied customers are and what they do, they're sort of people who come back again and again in our business. They, they don't really say very much. They don't compliment us about how wonderful things are, but things aren't bad enough that they'll, they'll moan. They may moan occasionally, but pretty much they're sort of okay. They're, they're you know, good. They're reasonably happy. They'll say things like, yeah, it's fine. Um, most people don't complain, but, you know, is really satisfying good enough for you? Is that where you want to be? Is that where you want to position yourself? I suggest not. I suggest your goal and my goal and every business in the world that wants to be outstanding, your goal is to create raving fans. So here are the keys to creating raving fans. I mentioned a few moments ago, silence is a message. If people aren't telling you what you're doing well and how wonderful you are, take it from me, it's because you're not. You may think you offer excellent customer service. The fact is you don't. You offer the same or similar to everybody else in your market. So silence is a message. You need to act on that message. And so is fine. Consistency is the key to winning raving fans. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is it's no use being outstanding occasionally. It's no use you having a wonderful employee, employee A, who delivers fantastic services, incredibly friendly, and they'll do whatever they, they can to help. Member of staff B is awful, not very friendly, just as the minimum, and is just maybe okay. So, consistency is a key. And how to create consistency is through systems. Systems are consistency. Having written systems within your business, systems which everyone adheres to, systems which everyone works to, and systems which people constantly look to improve within your business. It all starts with this thing that we hear a lot about in business called a mission statement. What is a mission statement? A mission statement, in my opinion, is where the business is headed, what we're wanting to do with our business, what we're wanting to create. So why do we need one? What's the point in actually having a mission statement? Well, it helps you, your management, your team, your customers and your suppliers to focus on what you should be delivering, what your business does, what this machine this wonderful business that you've got, where is it actually taking you? So what is your mission statement? Where are you going with your business? Is your mission statement to deliver satisfied customers? Or is it to create raving fans, an outstanding level of service, of products, of dependability and of consistency? If you think about, you know, anything that's the best in the world, then there is a certain standard to get there, isn't there? You know, but you may be thinking, well, you know, it's all very well for somebody who's world-class at sport or run a world-class business, you know, Bill Gates or somebody like that. They've got the money, they've got the time, and, you know, it, it's very difficult for me. You know, I'm a one-man band or, you know, I, I just run a small business. I've only got 20 people and we're all too busy to deliver these high levels of service. 
Well, it costs too much. What are you losing by not doing it? That's my question. Well, you know, you, this works for every business. You know, take a simple business like a taxi driver. You know, a taxi. How could you create raving fans in a taxi? Well, we all know the level of customer service that a typical taxi driver delivers. But six months ago, I went into a taxi and uh, I was blown away by the standard of service the taxi driver provided. I actually heard about the taxi through a referral. A friend of mine gave me a business card that he'd been given by this taxi driver. The taxi driver was called Ian. And uh, when, when Ian turned up at the side of the curb, and I, I called him, and he, he arrived so five, ten minutes later, um, he immediately leapt out of his taxi, which to start with was incredibly clean, which was a first for me. I immediately noticed he had a suit on, which, let's face it, most taxi drivers don't wear. Very smart suit, nice tie, clean shaven, looked very smart. He came straight round, helped me with my bags into the back of the taxi, and opened the door for me to get in the back. I got in the back and I noticed immediately how incredibly clean this taxi was, which for me was a first. He then came round and got in the driver's door, and he asked me where would I like to be taken. I told him where I needed to go, and he said, uh, fine. He, said, he then said to me, just to let you know that uh, throughout the journey, if you'd like to chat, I'm more than happy to do so, or if you want me to keep quiet and you've got work to do, or you just want to you know, look out the window, let the time go by, then I'm also happy to do that. Also, for your entertainment, in the seat behind me, I've got... Uh, today's newspapers and in the seat behind the passenger side there's a copy of uh, several magazines that you may be interested in reading. In the front I've, I've got a small fridge with uh, some cold drinks. I've got you know, Coke, lemonade, orange, uh, unfortunately no alcohol but uh, uh, they're, they're totally complimentary and if you'd uh, like to, uh, to, ha to have a drink just, uh, just please let me know. And I was totally blown away. I have never ever ever had that from a taxi driver. Have you? Now that was outstanding. That was way above anything you normally get. So what's your version? You know, what's your version of that? How could you push yourself to totally and utterly blow somebody away? Totally and utterly amaze them. What is your story? How could you take it far beyond what would be the norm? Now he didn't do anything that much, did he? He just provided some newspapers, a few magazines, and a, a free drink. You know, it, it wasn't a great deal. But do you think he, he gets good tips? You're absolutely right, he does. And I actually asked him, I said, you know, why, why do you do all this? What's all this about? And he said, well, to be honest, I used to spend so much time sitting at taxi ranks, absolutely hating what I did. He said, I now get all my business from personal recommendation and never ever sit at taxi ranks. So when you get out of the taxi, I'll give you six business cards which I'll ask you to pass on to other people. And that's where I get all my business from. So again, what's your story? There are three ways of creating raving fans and I'd like to now tell you about the first one. Now the first one is to create a vision of perfection centered on the customer. Brainstorm. What would be perfect? Now, I'm not asking you to be perfect, because we can never be perfect, but what I am asking you to be is outstanding. So create a vision of perfection. Brainstorm with your team. What would be perfect? What could you do to blow anybody else away? We then need to think about your operational standards, because the purpose of any business is to create and keep customers. So what are your operational standards? How are you going to run things? What's going to happen, for example, when someone calls and inquires about your service? What's going to happen when the, you provide the service? And what's going to happen after you've provided the service? Are they going to, for example, get a customer service call? I'm just calling, my name's Steve Mills, and I'm calling to make sure that you were happy with the service that we provided. If you don't do that, and other people within your business and within your industry don't do that, what are the implications of actually doing it? It's a great opportunity to ask for a referral, 
when that customer says, oh, you were fantastic, you did a great job for us, absolutely wonderful, and you say, thanks very much, Mr. Customer. I was wondering, we tend to go get a lot of business from sort of personal recommendation, from word of mouth, and I'm sure you know lots of people having been in business for how many years is it? Ten years, oh, wow, so you must know lots of people in business. Oh, yeah, I do, yeah. So, um... I was wondering whether you could maybe give me the name of maybe four or five people I could contact so that they can avail you know, themselves of our services. Would, would that be okay? Well, yeah, sure. And uh, would it be okay if I used your name um, just to make it easier for them to take my call? You get the idea of how having a customer service call that nobody else does sets you apart from anyone else. So why do we need these operational standards? Well, if I haven't just explained it enough, uh, we need it to push ourselves beyond what we normally do. What's the difference you know, between Fred's hamburger bar and McDonald's? Why do we go to McDonald's? The service is not that good, is it? Why would we rather stay at a trust house 40 than a local hotel? The reason is we've got operational standards and we know what we're going to get. We're going to get consistency, even if it's not the best. I'd like to give you another example, if I may. Something, once again, that happened to me in my life. About a year and a half ago, I was working down in Hastings uh, for the uh, local authority. And uh, I stayed at a place called Rye, which is a beautiful village just on the edge of Hastings, about 10 miles away. And I stayed at a hotel called the Mermaid Hotel. Our Mermaid Hotel is a 14th century inn. It's a beautiful place. I walked in the reception and I said, Hi, my name's Steve Mills. I've got a room book. And the lady behind the counter said, Hi, Mr. Mills, we've been expecting you. Did you have a nice journey? Now, that doesn't normally happen when I go into hotels. They don't normally say, Hi, Mr. Mills, we've been expecting you. Which I thought was a little bit strange, but I thought it was quite nice. She then said, would you mind filling in this card? So I filled in the usual registration form. Off I went up to my room. I got into the room, it was absolutely stunning. And there was a little card on the, the bed, on the, the pillow, and it said, thanks for staying at the Mermaid Hotel. If there's anything at all that we can do for you while you're here, just let us know. I thought, well, wow, that's nice. I went downstairs, had a wonderful meal in the restaurant, and off I went to bed. I woke up in the morning and uh, I thought I'll get myself a coffee before I go down to breakfast. And there's a little sign on the coffee tray and it said, your brand of coffee. I thought, wow, how did they know that? And then I remembered, filling out the registration form in reception, I put my brand of coffee. What brand of coffee I wanted. There's a little sign asking me to do it. And then... I had my coffee and went to go down to breakfast and there's a newspaper on the floor and it said, your newspaper. And I remembered when I registered, it asked me what newspaper I liked. I thought, wow, that's really cool. It's really nice that they do that. Went downstairs, had a wonderful breakfast. Off I went to do my work. About six weeks later, um, my son was playing football. He's a very keen footballer and he was playing in a tournament just outside of Hastings. So I said, well, let's stay there and uh, we'll stay at this wonderful hotel I went to. And uh, walked in the Mermaid Hotel with my son and uh, I said, my name's Steve Mills, I've got a room. Mr. Mills, it's great to see you. It's been about six weeks, the lady said. I thought, wow, that's amazing, she's remembered. She said, who's this? I said, this is Jamie, my son. He was about 12 years old at the time. She said, hi, Jamie. Um, was very friendly to him. Nothing more was said. I wasn't asked to fill in the registration card, which I thought was slightly strange, but off I went to our room. Woke up in the morning. There's a sign there on the coffee machine. It said, your brand of coffee. I thought, that is amazing. They've remembered. And I then opened the door, and there's a newspaper on the floor, and it said, your newspaper. I thought, this is unbelievable. They've remembered again. Off we went to play in Jamie's tournament, and home again. Six months later, I went back to the Mermaid Hotel. I walked in the door. I said, hi, my name's Steve Mills. I've got a room booked. Do you know what the lady said? She said, hi, Mr. Mills. It's great to see you back. It's been about six months, hasn't it? How's Jamie and did he win his football? Now, 
That, ladies and gentlemen, is outstanding service. Now, how did they remember? Well, clearly they didn't remember. What they did have was a system to do that. To enable them to do and to deliver that standard of service, they had to have a system. They had to have a system of recording customer information. They had to have a, a system to deliver it back to the customer. What is my point of that story? Well, my point is to get you to develop a similar system so that you can take your business to that level. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never, once again, ever stayed in a hotel that does that. No hotels do that. I don't care whether you're talking about the most expensive hotel in, in London or a, a b and somewhere. But the point is they could. Now, how much does it cost? Next to nothing. How much is it worth? Thousands. Thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Millions of pounds, dollars, yen, euros onto your business and my business by delivering outstanding service. So do great businesses employ great people? You know, a lot of people say to me, well, you know, it's all very well and good, but I can't get my people to do it. You won't get people to do it without a system, without a proven system and without the training. It's essential, if you think about it, therefore, for any organisation to manage the customer's total experience. Everything from the way they book in, the way they arrive at your business, the way they're dealt with, their first impression, the right way through the sales process and out the other end. So, thanks for taking the time to listen and good luck in creating Raving Fan. Boy, that brings back some memories, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I actually was working while I was uh, recording that, but uh, certainly listening to it as uh, as we went through it, and uh, it reminded me, you know, of of my business and what can I do to change things, to improve things, to get things really better. And I actually wrote down about three or four things that uh, I'm going to do. One of which is I'm going to create an email uh, follow-up uh, system for new clients so that at the end of month one, month two, month three, and so on and so forth, that our system automatically sends the client an email asking them the same thing each month. On a scale of one to ten, how well did we perform this month? So they can rate us, not, oh, yes, it was fine, or, yeah, you did a good job, but actually physically rate us. Uh, question two, why did you give us that score? So whether it's high or low or in between, you know, if it's high, they might say, well, it's because you did this or because you did that. If it's low, you know, they might say, well, you know, there was a bit of a problem, bit of a delay or whatever, and and if it's just average and so on. Uh and, uh, and the last question, so it's just a three-question email, is what could we have done better um, and what could we do better next month? So looking at trying to get some feedback as to how we can improve in some way. And uh, I'm going to set that up so it goes out automatically on our emails uh, for probably a couple of years. Let, uh, let's just kick off with that. So they get 24 emails once a month, probably to go out on the first of every month. And uh, that's that. So that's what we, we're going to do. Uh, and uh, hopefully get some uh, really good feedback and uh, equally uh, realise if there's a problem there that perhaps clients are not telling us about. So uh, that's it. Thank you ever so much for listening. Uh, again, if you're new to my podcast, please, um, you know, download it, subscribe to it, get involved with it. If you need any help uh, in terms of growing your business, as you may know, I spent 25 years helping businesses to make millions of pounds, <coughs> excuse me, in additional income. So if you need any help with that, feel free to get in touch. Uh, the best way of doing that is through my website where you can book uh, a meeting. And uh, to do that, go to steve-mills.com. 
www.thepodcastmaker.com. Thank you ever so much again and uh, look forward to speaking to you again on my podcast very, very soon. Thank you.